Well, thank you, Morrison. It's very generous of you. Um, thank you for that, and, and thank you to, uh, to you and Chuck and, and Chris for, um, um, for, for two other things. First, um, and, and I, I speak for my fellow panelists, um, thank you for not putting us on immediately after Dan's presentation this morning. That was, that was a dazzling shock and awe presentation, if I've ever seen one. And I'm just so grateful we didn't have to follow it. Uh, but also, thank you for, for giving me as co-panelists two of the leading authorities in the country on this subject. And I, I think everyone here will see what I mean in just a moment. So with that, um, all of that taken care of, Wendy, let's talk about how I-9 compliance has changed. I think it has changed a good bit. Um, you know, I think we heard in the earlier panels that there has been an ebb and flow to immigration compliance and that now we're in the upswing of a new era of, of compliance. So I think that that's definitely impacted, uh, you know, this area. You also have E-Verify in the mix, which I think also has created an added level of complexity to immigration compliance. And then since 2004, you have the, you know, the, uh, the increase of electronic I-9 compliance. You know, in 2004, the legislation came out that allowed employers to complete and retain I-9s in electronic form, and I think that that has added a significant level of complexity to this compliance. I would say also the other piece is the states coming to play. I mean, if you have followed any of the legislation that has come out of the states after Arizona, you've seen that now states are beginning to, you know, step into the area of compliance. South Carolina has asked E-Verify to provide them lists and information regarding the compliance by their employers. Um, we're beginning to see other states in the latest draft of the revisions to the Alabama immigration law. One of the pieces that we saw that was introduced and it passed the House yesterday is that now the Alabama Department of Homeland Security, if that becomes law, you have the authority to ask for immigration records to ensure that Alabama employers are compliant. Now, whether you're going to turn them over or not, that'll be, you know, another story. So I think that that has also impacted how it has changed. And, and these state E-Verify rules are all uniform, of course. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> um, no, in fact, to give you an example, Mississippi, when Mississippi passed their E-Verify rule in 2007, they have even mandated that you verify independent contractors, anybody that you, you know, issue a 1099 to. And we're seeing a bit of disconnect. I think that has changed in, in the latter year. Uh, but initially, you know, states thought that they could mandate participation in E-Verify however they felt like it. Now they realize that they can mandate that you participate, but that the program itself remains a voluntary program and that you will have to comply with the rules of use set forth by the federal government. So. I think all of that has added to, you know, an increased complexity on I-9 compliance. Just makes lawyers rich. Uh, John, could you uh, touch for just a moment on the current paper process? Sure. I think we've heard quite a, quite a bit today about the I-9 being perhaps the most complicated one-page form in America. Um, and I think to a large degree it is because the rules are really not um, very facile or very transparent. You have certain fields which are required. You have certain fields um, which perhaps uh, have to be in sync between section one and section two. You have situations where you have to be careful about completing too much information. Um, so the end result becomes uh, this really mishmash of rules that you need to keep in your head and Obviously, when you have even a larger workforce, and, and many organizations have them spread out, you can't have just one person completing all the I-9s. Um, no matter how smart you think you are, no matter how much knowledge you know about I-9 compliance, the reality is you're not the one who's going to be completing every single I-9 to your organization. So that has created the situation that we're in where we wind up seeing you know, industry averages being 50% uh, error rate or even higher. So, you know, that's, that's where we're starting from, you know, even when employers do get uh, attorney training and so forth, it has to be done very frequently, uh, very you know, updated all the time, and it's just impossible to get a hold of everything um, throughout your entire organization. 
So tell us a little bit about electronic kinetics. So, and I um, I apologize, but this is a um, this is a Prezi, by the way. Uh, so you're going to see some animations here and there, um, just to uh, liven up a little bit. The uh, so I, I work for Law Logics. We we uh, specialize in I nine E Verify immigration case management solutions. So I work with engineers all day, and in working with engineers, I can tell you that many of them feel as though the I nine um, perhaps could be an, an artificial life form, uh, kind of takes on a, a life of its own when you think about all the different rules and so forth that you have to build into it. Um, however, you know, I assure you there's, with a few exceptions, there's very few mad scientists involved. Um, what really defines an electronic I-9 is it's largely a creation by regulation. Uh, so we have a body of regulations, which Wendy is going to speak about in a minute. Um, but if you're wondering uh, what is an electronic I-9, how does it differ from a paper, there are certain characteristics that you will think about. Number one, and this might seem very obvious, uh, they're by and large paperless. Uh, you're talking about moving from a paper system, so you're going to see an electronic I-9 that generally has a digital representation. Maybe it's being completed uh, on a, in a software application on a computer screen. Maybe it's a tablet. Whatever it is, it's designed to emulate how the paper form looks, um, even if that is flawed to begin with. Second, it has to be smart. And when I say smart, I mean it has to essentially have a lot of rules built into it. We've heard a lot about the M274, which is kind of the, the I-9 Bible, if you will. So an electronic I-9 system has to know when these fields are required. It has to know when fields need to match up between section one and section two. These are characteristics you're going to find in addition. And then lastly, sorry, I'll just you know, put this one point in here. It has to have specific safeguards, and this is where the regulations come into play. Um, and I think, by and large, what the government is saying is, yes, you can do electronic I-9s, but we want to see the man behind the curtain. We want to know exactly what's going on. Well, we've heard comments today um, from, from some of our colleagues and from government speakers that one of the great virtues of, of an electronic I-9 system is that it, it, it's sort of foolproof. It prevents you from, from uh, making errors. Um, my experience certainly is that it depends on the electronic I-9 system. Um, w would you like to talk about that? Yeah, well, again, there are, you know, ICE is very uh, adamant about saying this. They do not certify any particular one vendor. There are a body of regulations which are vague at best to a large degree. And so a lot of companies out there are really have left their, their own device in terms of creating the system. So when you have that type of scenario, you wind up having a very broad spectrum of compliance. You may have companies which simply have taken the form, made it digital, added a few rules here and there, but maybe they haven't paid attention to all the other safeguards which we're going to talk about. Um, you may have, uh, like we discussed with uh, Director Morton, the Abercrombie and Fitch scenario, where they clearly missed a rather fundamental step in the process. And just to reiterate, who's responsible, the vendor or the user? Well, I think you, you, heard, you heard from ICE. It's, ultimately, it's the employer's responsibility. The onus is on the employer. Um, now, that's not to say that the vendor has to be completely out of the loop. Uh, I think, to a large degree, the vendor's responsibility is contractual. Uh, and that's something we'll perhaps talk about a little bit later as well. But it, it's sort of like closing the barn door after the horse is gone. If you pick the wrong vendor, you... Uh, and if your indemnity agreement was not good. Yeah, yeah. You, you may have recourse, but you really don't want to be in a position to have to seek it. Um, okay, so where do we go from here? Um, we're, we're going to talk about the regulations, the uh, ICE Memorandum of Understanding that that governs what uh, electronic I-9 systems must incorporate. We're going to talk about uh, RFPs, how to put them together, attorney participation in that system, and E-Verify and E-Verify integration into electronic I-9s. Wendy, would you care to start us off on regulations? Sure. Um, the Ability for, like I said earlier, the ability for employers to, you know, create and retain I-9 in electronic format came out in 2004. Uh, the first set of regs were introduced June 5th of 2006, and the final set of regs were, um, you know, 
finalized in July 22nd of 2010. So you did have, you know, four years in, in there in which we had, you know, interim regs, but there was nothing finalized. The changes to between the interim and the final regs were substantial in some ways, but they were not dramatic. I mean, they didn't completely rewrite the regs. There were some changes, especially to the area of audit trails, in which it limited what the audit trail was supposed to capture. In particular, one thing, which was you were not supposed to capture what it's every time that you view the I-9, which the old um, interim regs did. So you can see that there's been some time out there in which these things have been um, you know, just, just kind of left out there for a lot of vendors to interpret in many, in many ways or in whichever way they want it. When I look at these regulations, you know, we've also tried to mirror how does how this work in the paper world? And then does it make sense when you apply that to the electronic world? It's one of the ways that I have been able to explain them to myself and then be able to explain it to my clients because sometimes when we talk to them about electronic rights, they just look at you like you're crazy. Um, to give you an example, the, the first, one of the first pieces is that it, you, know, you cannot change anything on the form. You cannot change the sequence, you cannot change the data, uh, the name or the content. So the way I look at it is, if I get this very complex one pager, as Chuck mentioned earlier, and I start going through it and saying, oh, well, the hard aid's hidden in there, I don't really see it, so I'm gonna move it up here. And then I'm going to change this field and I'm going to turn it into something else. And I basically recreate my old I-9. And then they, you know, my uh, SAC office comes in and audits me. What are they going to say? <laughs> what is Rachel going to say when she gets this, you know, rewritten <laughs> I-9? Well, some of the software packages that are out there have basically done that. And I think that the reason behind that is because it's mostly driven by engineers. And they're looking at it in terms of, how can we make this process easier for you to, you know, complete, not comply? So they want to make it easier for you to complete the form, but they forget that this is not necessarily a system or a process that is designed to just simplify things. It's a compliance tool. And I think that that has been a lot of the disconnect. Uh, you know, other parts of the regulations include a lot of safeguards, that they have to be safe. You can go back to, I think, what was it? It, it was it 2010 or 11 where the FTC, um, you know, filed charges against lookout services, and this is all public record. I think John did a great blog on that because there was a breach of data, and, you know, and the data was exposed, and somebody was able to hack into their entire database. You, these forms also contain incredible amounts of personal identifiable information. Well, let's pause there for, for a moment, and, and uh, both of you perhaps can address yourselves to the MOU and the requirement that it has to be developed, the system has to be developed, and all the storage has to um, stay within the United States and the security concerns there. That's the E-Verify MOU, and yes, you're absolutely correct. I mean, the E-Verify MOU dictates that the development uh, for web services uh, as a designated agent I, I thought that was the electronic I-9 no, it's, 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 it's the E-Verify, I'm yeah. yeah. but, 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 but still, I mean, I, I think the, the point behind it is that there is very specific rules and requirements around any of this, whether you're talking about electronic I-9s, whether or not you're talking about E-Verify integration. Um, so it's not something that uh, employers can go into lightly, just thinking that any particular system they choose is necessarily going to be following it, um, because a lot of times, these things are buried under pages and pages of requirements, um, which you know, even as attorneys, it can be challenging to read and, and to, to reconcile with the I-9 form. And I think you bring a really valid point, Ron. I mean, one of the questions that I always ask when looking at these systems is where's the data stored? I mean, and if they tell me that this, the data is gonna be stored in India or Indonesia or some other offsite outside of the United States, when we're talking about social security numbers, you know, basically a document that would allow you to steal somebody's identity pretty much, do you want that stored, you know, outside of the United States? And what does that say about having a system that is secure, that is compliant? Uh, you know, the other thing that I would suggest that any of you that is dealing with this, um, you know, issue or that's considering either moving to an electronic system or has an electronic system in place is looking at the audit trails. I think, as Rachel mentioned, that is something that ICE is beginning to really look at more deeply. 
What are the audit trails capturing? What are they not capturing? Are they just a milestone audit trail? Or are they really an audit trail that captures every time that a field in that electronic I-9 has been changed? By who? What did it, what was it originally and what did it change to? Because that is the only way in which ICE can actually follow what was done. I mean, and go back to the idea of looking at it from a paper standpoint. What she's asking you to do when you're making corrections to the I-9 is to cross over. Don't use write-out, don't, you know, block it out so that they can see what was there, mm -hmm. what is now, and who did it and when. And I think that that's what they're looking at. But a lot of the audit trails that we're seeing in these, you know, software do not capture that information. And they also are bringing in um, data points or date points from some of the other systems that they're borrowing, and I think that that's problematic. To, to, to highlight this point, um, and I, I have to, to say that talking about audit trails probably has to be the least sexiest topic um, that I could possibly yeah. think of. Um, normally, I can actually see people's eyes starting to glaze over and sort of uncontrollable yawning. So in other words of saying, please, um, I won't blame you. But if we think about audit trails, and as Wendy was saying, I think, again, think about it just from the paper perspective. You have a paper there. Um, what is an ICE forensic auditor doing now for that audit trail? What, what is a paper audit trail? Well, perhaps it's the person's handwriting. Perhaps it was the color of ink that they used in section one versus section two. Um, perhaps it was visible changes to the form. We heard in the last panel that Chuck talked about the uh, missing uh, staple holes. Uh, was that actual documents that were connected to the I-9, or was it simply the instructions that they removed later on? Regardless, you need to, uh, as a, an investigator, you want to examine all of those elements in order to tell whether or not the form is still, uh, in, you know, uh, maintaining its integrity. Now, in the, in the electronic platform, the way this works generally is, as Wendy was mentioning, anytime a form is created, it's modified, it's updated, it's corrected. A secure and permanent record has to be created that says who did it, when they did it, and what the action was taken. So here's just a representation of one. And let's imagine, for example, you have an employer, and let's say they're in Arizona, which is um, where we're from uh, at LawLogix, and so E-Verify is mandatory. So that employee comes in, and let's say the person has a green card, but maybe it's a green card that really doesn't look so great. And the employer knows this, and they know that E-Verify is going to catch this. It's going to look at the photo matching tool, and it's going to catch it. So then they say, you know what? Yeah, I don't think I want that after all. Why don't you give me a driver's license and Social Security card instead? So obviously, there's, there's an element of fraud that is going on there. Uh, but how would that be captured in an electronic I-9 system? Well, here is one example where you see at 9.10 uh, in the morning on this March 1st, we had I-551 green card information, which was there, and now it's null. And then five minutes later, you now have an Arizona driver's license. How convenient. This is the type of information that you can drill down when you're looking at an audit trail. If an audit trail, all it said was section one was completed on this date, section two was completed on that date, you would lose all of that information. So again, you know, why does this matter? Who really cares? You know, audit trail is an audit trail. Well, again, if you look at the regulations, there's a provision there that says if any one of these elements, including audit trails, is not uh, performed up to, to speed, they can essentially deem that the I-9 has not been completed at all. So now imagine a situation where every single one of your I-9s was completed in this electronic system. It, all of these I-9s have this problem, and now all of a sudden, you have no I-9s. As we've been talking about, that would be a serious problem. And let me add to that. One of the things that I always look at is when is that audit trail created? Is it created in real time as you're making changes, or is the audit trail captured when you hit save and upload the document? So basically, when you have finished the I-9 and you have closed it up, is it at that time that the audit trail is created, or is it being created as you're going along? Because when you read the regulation, it tells you that you have to ensure that whenever a record is created, there's a permanent record that is established. And it, it's, in my opinion, or at least in my mind, it's in real time. It can't be after the fact. The other thing that I look at is, does the audit trail also cover attached documents to the I-9? 
I mean, go back to what Chuck was mentioning earlier, the staple patterns. Well, here you're not stapling anything to the form, but you are uploading documents if you're keeping copies of it, or if you're an E-Verify employer, I mean, there's certain documents that you have to retain. And so does that audit trail also capture the fact that you uploaded the documents and if those documents were deleted? And, you know, there are some systems that do, but most of the ones that I've looked at do not. And so those are the things that I think you have to be able to understand and evaluate when you're picking the software. Our, our next slide deals with uh, pros and cons, and, and this has been touched on by other panels and, uh, and, and briefly by Director Morton, and not to, not to throw you to a curveball, but to give us a little more time for RFPs, maybe we can incorporate um, pros and cons into the RFP drafting process because I think the message that, that we want to get across is that there really is the, the capability out there if, if you look for the right vendor, and, and there, there are many who, who will do this for you, there really is the capability to have an almost foolproof system that will, that will prevent you from making mistakes, that will give you um, a proper audit trail, that will safeguard your information. But you have to know what you're looking for, and, and that comes through the RFP process. Right, and, and you know, RFP, request for proposal, very typical in, in, in choosing software because it, it does allow you to ask a, a series of standardized questions across multiple vendors. Um, these can be questions which are important to you um, as a company, important to you as counsel to a company, um, and as, as Ron was mentioning, they do need to incorporate um, the, the pros and the cons. So in terms of, for example, integrating with E-Verify, that's just one of, one of the, the many pros that, that we have listed here, that obviously is all about having a system that um, follows the E-Verify rules, perhaps, uh, that allows you to mirror the way your company is currently using E-Verify. Uh, because as we've talked about, E-Verify is not required nationally. So you may have certain places, California, maybe you're not doing E-Verify. Somewhere else you are doing E-Verify. Uh, does the software system allow you to compartmentalize that? Does it allow you to centralize it? Um, for example, Wendy, I'll, I'll turn and ask you a question. Many times we have, uh, we have clients and they have, you know, very spread out and they're trying to decide, okay, should my person on the ground, the one who's actually doing the I-9, reviewing the documents, should they submit to E-Verify directly? Or should someone else in a corporate headquarters, for example, review that submission to before it goes to E-Verify? Obviously, you want to have that flexibility. But is there any kind of best practices or things that you would look for in making that determination? I mean, we look at definitely the, the company as a whole. Um, you know, I think that it's going to depend on how sophisticated and how capable is the company to train the person on the ground uh, to make sure that E-Verify goes smoothly. Now, I mean, they still will have to interact with the employee in terms of the TNC. That's how you want it. I mean, we have companies that will totally centralize E-Verify, including the handling of a TNC, where the only thing that the local person does is either print out the letters and hand them over to the employee, whether it's in a you know, sealed envelope, and then they will call central office, and then that's how it will handle it. But um, I will say this, I mean, one of the things, going back to the cons in some of these programs that integrate with E-Verify, one of the things that I'm looking at is did in the way that they've gone through the I-9 process, do they mix and mingle the E-Verify attestations? Because I see that a lot. So that whenever you're clicking on the I accept or, you know, or attest under penalty of perjury for the I-9, there's also this whole host of attestations from E-Verify that have nothing to do with the I-9 process at, at that moment. And that in my opinion, it's almost you know, rewriting the I-9. And we might get there when E-Verify becomes mandatory, may, maybe you know, some years in the future, but not at the moment. So I do think that there's an issue there. Uh, and also, if, if I might add one additional thing, I get the sense that there are some companies that will attempt to let you think that they have been certified by ICE be in the I-9 yeah. process because they are a designated agent with E-Verify. And just because that happened, you know, and they are indeed a designated agent for E-Verify, has no bearing whatsoever on whether their I-9 
product is compliant or not. So I think that that creates a little bit of an issue. And that, that's an issue where you're taking um, a truth and kind of expanding and exaggerating it out. So there is a qualification test that is involved with any electronic I-9 provider working with E-Verify. Essentially, they have to test their software to make sure that when they send information, um, E-Verify comes back and says, yay, you, we got it. You know, here's a response back, and you're like, yeah, okay, wonderful, we're now talking to each other. That's called being qualified, that's called being approved, but it's being approved by the E-Verify vendor, not by the Department of Homeland Security. But the problem is you wind up reading that in the marketing literature, and all of a sudden it seems like, oh, we've been approved by DHS. And, and, and to be clear, ICE has very deliberately refrained from certifying or, or providing any kind of certification criteria. We heard or, it here today. Yeah. He, and, and, she, and Rachel was absolutely clear. They're, they're not going to go there. They're, yeah. they're not in the process of, in the, um, you know, business of policing vendors. And it's you, buyer beware. Which, which is a shame because the IRS does it. And, and you'd think that uh, you'd like to see the sheriff clean up Dodge City. Well, but I think that that feeds very well into the RFP process. I mean, I think that that is your due diligence as an employer for the buyer beware. And it's going to depend on who's involved in the RFP, RFP, who drafts it for you, what questions you ask, and what type of responses do you accept. And what about, what about the role of the attorney as acting as a contractor with the vendor as a subcontractor in order to provide to uh, retain privilege? We've thought of that, especially you know when vendors are providing audit results, if the vendor is participating in any way in an audit form, and I think it's going to be something that you have to talk to your client about and let them make that. I mean, ultimately, it's their decision, so you're just there to counsel, uh, but you have to explain to them the risks of going one way or the other, and then evaluating what is the likelihood and what exposure do they have, and do they want to take the, you know, the position of, of using you as the point of contact with that vendor. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry. But, yes, ma'am. But today during the during a couple of your panels, we were told specifically that that uh, the electronic form won't work because the number one section has to be done by the by the prospective employee <clears throat> and that has to be signed by that person. It, it, the information to me is very contradictory. Well, it depends on the on the vendor that you're talking about. Most vendors do provide those kinds of safeguards to prevent you from over documenting or under documenting or having the the wrong people no, fill up. I mean, even if it's just a, just an I nine. Uh, that, that's what I'm talking about on, on the I nine. Mixed in with the e or not combined with e just the I nine. Uh, how is the employee going to fill this out? Sign it. I think what you're referring to is in one of the earlier panels, the question was asked whether if the I-9 is pre-populated, if the fields of the electronic mm -hmm. I-9 are pre-populated coming in from other systems no, that no, the employer may have in no, place. I understand that, but uh, how is it going to get populated at all, and how is that person going to sign it? I, so, I will give you an example. Oh, Law Logics, I think you guys sent an email, right, to the employee so in that, some cases? There's a variety of ways that an employee generally can plead an electronic I 9. Think of the most, the simplest way is uh, I'm the new hire employee, Wendy is the employer, um, and we have a computer here that has an electronic I 9 system on it. Uh, I'm the employee, I'm going to walk up. I'm actually going to complete the I-9, and I'm going, to, I'm going to electronically sign it. I'm going to make my mark um, through the software. Um, then Wendy's going to come over, and she's going to complete Section 2. She's going to review my document. So that's the way it's done. That's one well, of the ways, yeah. I heard, I heard, you know, that, that it really can't be done electronically, and then I heard, you know, people just talking as if uh, doing it electronically is... Uh, is the way to go, and I find it very confusing. I think if I could, yeah, no, if, if I could summarize it, I think I, I would definitely go with the, well, I'm biased, but I would say that electronic I-9s are definitely the way to go. However, there's a caveat because of all these different complications. If the system auto-populates, 
if there's not a particular check within the system to make sure that that electronic signature validates that it was actually the employee and, and not Wendy actually doing my I-9? It has to be the employee. That's right. right. Mm -hmm. Yes. And a question, well, I guess I'm just And I think that's a legitimate concern, but I think that would, you, you as a client would have to have very good processes set forth and good training by which you would document to the yes. government what your process is and that it is the employee actually. And absolutely, the employee has to do this. No question. Mm -hmm. Peggy. Yeah, can I just ask a John Morton's comment, because I asked about this question, uh, and, he's, and he said that, you know, um, USCIS, well, could you elaborate on what he was referring to in his discussions with USCIS waiting for something to happen? Is USCIS going to develop an electronic USCIS has been talking about, about developing a smart I-9. Uh, it was, if you actually look at the preamble to, I think it was the, um, the interim reg, they talk about, uh, you know, the, the smart I-9. So that's what, what that is going to be, whether it's just going to be a smart PDF that you just go online and it just has some little bells and whistles. We don't really know. The, one of the last uh, liaison meetings that we had with uh, CIS not too long ago, what they discussed is that it will be uh, modeled after the new I-9 that is coming out, uh, you know, when that is after the rules and comment period. My guess is it's somewhat of a half solution. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, you'll have a smart I-9. You would presume that it'll actually follow the rules. It'll get you an I-9 that's completed correctly. But then from where, what do you do with it from there? Do you print it out and you sign it? There's, there's no indication that we've heard so far that there's any retention of it. So you're still going to have a paper okay. document. Mm -hmm. you're, you're not necessarily going to have, for example, a re-verification reminder. It's unclear how or if it integrates with E-Verify. So at this point, it, I don't think we know enough to comment. There will be a whole system for the company to have all of their I-9s in, in, in the system. My, my guess, personally, yeah, it would be maybe the smart form would be very good for smaller employers who don't necessarily need a full-fledged electronic mm -hmm. uh, I-9 system, which uh, you know tends to become even more effective with scale because you obviously have a lot of different players involved. Uh, you need to enforce policy across a broad organization. Maybe you've got a smaller um, employer, and they simply want to make sure they do the form right, and maybe they don't have the budget. But I find, you know, from today's information, it, it is really Well, let, let's not lose sight of, of the opportunity here. We're talking about a couple of different issues. One is make sure that your electronic I-9 vendor complies with, with all requirements. And that, that's not hard to do. But in, in doing that, let's not lose sight of the fact that or of the opportunity that is presented through the use of electronic I-9s. By moving over to electronic I-9s, you can put in intelligent expert systems that will help you avoid making costly mistakes. You can put in systems that will automatically kick out reminders for re-verification. You can do a whole host of wonderful things. This is, this is the direction everyone really wants to go. Mm. We don't want to go backward to paper. paper leads to mistakes and fines and all kinds of problems. Oh, yeah. And electronic gives you an enormous amount of increased management oversight. I mean, from being able to tell you, give you a report that says, you know, X person in X location is consistently completing the I-9s late. Well, that's something that you would not have the benefit of knowing if you're in a paper world until much later if you decide to go audit that location. So there's a lot of great benefits to having a good I-9 uh, electronic system. But you want to be sure that what's built into the system is correct. I've and that the well, system this, itself I've is compliant. An employee come who is being let go by the company because his green card had expired. Mm -hmm. He had uh, applied for citizenship. And their system said that he was uh, out of compliance. We're, so in other words, they didn't know the law. Mm -hmm. 
can, can, we'll, we'll take that up with you after the panel, but we're, we're going to have to move on. Um, Do you still want to talk about the RFP? Yeah, let, let's wrap up on it because I, I think that is the most critical aspect of, of this whole panel. I mean, to me, the, the main issues in the RFP is, first of all, who's going to draft it and, and what are you going to ask? Because that's really what's going to drive the responses that you get from the vendors. I would suggest that you have IT involved, that somebody that is familiar with electronic I-9 probably is going to be outside counsel because I doubt that your general counsel is going to have the expertise of dealing with it. And then obviously HR. And I think it's only when you have that combination of experts that you're going to be able to pick the right program. If you have only one of the three, then you're probably not going to end up with a compliant program. Uh, and then also that you really critically evaluate the responses and not just buy into marketing hype. I think that that's important, that you don't just sit there for a you know, dog and pony show that it's you know, an easy demo that is just there to sell you, but that you ask the tough questions. Uh, we also like to have the ability to talk to the council that you know, helped create the system so that you can talk to them on a you know, higher level so you can, you can actually pick out whether the system is compliant or not. I would suggest actually that uh, you know, I understand why it seems murky because mm -hmm. um, you know, the regulations are not very clear. We have E-Verify floating out there. We have this other smart form which may or may not appear. I would suggest though that it becomes a lot less murky um, once you start going through an RFP process yeah. because you, as Wendy mentioned, you're doing due diligence. Um, you're discovering a lot of the elements of what makes a good system and that might be, for example, handling very tricky situations. Um, many employers fall into that trap of once any green card expires saying, oops, I need to re-verify. It's very common. One of the, the most common OS, OSC um, settlement, if you go to their website, is they're almost entirely people that are either asking specifically for a green card from a legal permanent resident, even though that person can show a driver's license unrestrict, an unrestricted social security card. Yeah. You start diving into an RFP, you start asking those questions, you start learning whether or not the system can handle that. Um, I'll also go a little bit step further, even beyond the compliance angle, um, especially if you're a larger organization, you need to be able to make sure that vendor can help you um, manage the entire process. Because it's not simply a matter of flipping a switch and all of a sudden you're using a system. You need to figure out who's going to be using it, what are their user privileges, what kind of configuration options are you going to have in terms of using E-Verify or not using E-Verify? Um, you know, this simple one-page form becomes very complicated when you think about all of the steps and decisions. It's one of the reasons why um, attorneys recommend compliance plans because it can get very complex. Well, I think you also need to ask the question, uh, how precisely are things going to be handled when ICE shows up? Oh, that's a great one. That's a great point. What, uh, how easily can you retrieve the data? What form is it going to come out in? Um, would you like to talk about some of your um, experiences? Because yeah. I, I know this is a hot button topic with well, you. Well, we had an audit not too long ago uh, where our client was using an electronic system and there were two things that we discovered when we got you know, to the actual client site. One was that the system was designed so that if you did not actually complete and save the I-9s, the I-9s were purged. And we had a rogue HR employee at that location that would basically complete Section 1, make copies of the documents, leave them on his desk, and then never bother to come in and complete Section 2 and basically save and finalize that I-9. And what that system did was just purged that I-9, so it was nowhere to be found in the system. Um, and then the other problem that we had in that same situation was the printing. Um, they, they wouldn't give it to you in electronic format. There was no way, and we were, after we looked at the system, we made the decision that we were not going to volunteer giving access to, this, to uh, the auditor in that case so that they could just go looking into the system. And they actually didn't ask for access. They just asked for the printed I-9s. So we spent three days printing and hitting print four times for every one of the 3,000 employees that we turned over I-9s. One for the I-9, one for the E-Verify uh, confirmation page, one for every one of the documents that had been uh, uploaded with the, with the document, and one for the audit trail. It was not fun. Uh, so one of the things that we asked from, from then on is, do you have a batch printing system? Is there a way that I can tell the system, I want the I-9s from this date to that date, and I want 
everything and is it printed in a correlated manner? Well, and, a, and another issue that that is is vitally important. Um, the employer may um, may decide to move over to another vendor, or a vendor may go out of business. Who owns the data? That's key, and I think that's a contractual um, you know, issue. Uh, I would make sure that in your contract with that vendor, it's clearly specified that you own the data. But of course, vendors turn this over promptly if there's a problem. Absolutely, but you know, if it's not your data, also the question is, can the government come in and subpoena that data from the vendor, and you're well, not even aware of it? I was thinking about the litigation that, that tied data up for six months. Uh, I think you're referring to Alexis Nexus yeah. US Verify. Um, and it's all public record, so you can go Google it and you will find it. Lexis Nexus was using a reseller for uh, I-9 purposes with, with their clients. It was not clearly disclosed to the clients that they were using you as Verify. I think it was marketed to the clients as Lexis Nexus was providing this um, you know, product through Choice Point, which was their, um, you know, one of their subsidiaries. And what came out of it is that at some point in time, at the end of 2010, the relationship between LexisNexis and US Verify started going south. And in 2011, LexisNexis made the decision not to renew the contract with US Verify. And then, you know, they filed a case in Atlanta, Georgia, and, you know, all hell broke loose. And basically what ended up happening was there were a lot of, the well, pretty much all of the Lexis clients didn't have access to the data if they didn't accept moving to the new vendor that LexisNexis had selected. The clients got an email notice from Lexis saying them, telling them, oh, by the way, we're no longer going to use US Verify. We're using this other system now, and we're going to be switching within a week. And if you're not happy, well, then you can make your own arrangements. So we had clients that made the decision not to move because they had, quite frankly, had the opportunity to vet the new vendor. Um, so there were, you know, clients that were there and didn't have the data. It ended up in a settlement agreement where LexisNexis paid U.S. Verify close to three hundred and fifty thousand dollars, so that U.S. Verify would transfer the data to Lexis because that was part of the disagreement, uh, you know, and, and the lawsuit. How was the data going to be turned over? Lexis was asking U.S. Verify to turn it over to their new vendor or in a specific format. But U.S. Verify said in court, you know, we didn't agree to that. That's not part of our contract. We can provide it to you in this format, but not in the other one you want. And if you want us to provide it to you in that format, it's going to take a significant amount of money. And in the end, Lexis paid U.S. Verify to be able to turn it over. So I think this really just highlights how important the software contract is. Um, you think about it typically is oh, it's just a software license agreement, it's no big deal. Um, however, and there's, these come in many different flavors in terms of whether or not you're doing a general services agreement, whether or not it's broken up into different statements of work, but however it's done, the point is you want to specify very, very clearly that uh, you know, if you're representing the employer, the employer owns the data, the employer has the right to get the data you know, in, in this amount of time period. Not only that, that they have to provide it in an industry standard format, and you might actually want to specify what that is, yep. whether that's you know, XML, it's going to be tagged PDFs, it's going to be whatever it is that you know that you're going to feel comfortable if you get uh, all, you know, ICE all of a sudden comes knocking at your door and, and you're like, oh my gosh, I've just switched vendors, how am I going to get my, my data out? that you can have that comfort level built in. And um, also the time that they will have to provide it to you. Yeah. Yes. And you can't come ask yes. for it and they say, oh yeah, sure, but it's gonna be six months from now before we're gonna give you our nine stuff. John, can we go back to the, the slide you were on, on before on um, what the vendor has to provide? And could you address this, please? Yeah, so here are just some of the, the items that, again, this is all regulatory, so it's based in there. Um, as Wendy mentioned, you're going to have a variety of different standards depending upon where your audit uh, occurs throughout the country. So in certain places, and you know, and again, this just, just highlights the fact that there not necessarily is uniformity in this, and, and it's understandable because the, the regulations are, are clear as mud. But in some instances, you'll have situations where even though you're electronic, um, ICE will come in and simply ask for paper copies. Um, and it might, might seem kind of funny, but 
that's what you that's what you can provide is and if you're representing counsel you're probably more than happy to, to just provide that um, however if you're somewhere else they might ask for a whole lot more and so if you're planning for using a system or you're advising someone on using a system you need to make sure it presents all of this other stuff so in addition to i9s the audit trail so I showed you a little capture of an audit trail, a sample audit trail, which was very simple, right? It was just taking a green card, uh, removing it, and then adding a driver's license instead. Yet that was like five or six different rows. So now imagine taking an audit trail for, you know, 100 I-9s or 1,000 I-9s. This could be very, very large uh, in amount of information. So you need to make sure that your vendor can produce that, and it can produce it and associate it with your I-9 record. Again, depending upon where you're audited, the audit trail might be very, very important. Um, many will ask for this all information field. Again, using electronic I-9 system, it essentially becomes a database of sorts. Yeah. So they may just want to actually do that because when they're auditing, they're actually just typing in information into a very similar spreadsheet anyway. So they might say, hey, why don't we just get this information from you? So that is also important. And then these last three are the ones which we only see occasionally. Um, but again, they're very important. ICE, if they want, they can ask for a whole lot more in terms of judging how well the system is working and how the employer is using the system. So they can actually ask for standard operating procedures in terms of how is the system supposed to work? How is Section 1 completed? How, how is the employee actually logging into the system, for example? Um, all that sort of information. Description of features. What does the system do? Is it pre-populating or is it not? How is the electronic signature being applied? Um, and they might even, although we haven't seen this, they could technically, under the regs, ask for access. They could say, we want to log in and we want to use the system. So that's where it becomes super important to have an auditor account, if you will, something that would be limited where you could say, I want the I-9s from this particular location, from not this particular location, but I want current employees versus um, employees that have been, uh, um, mm -hmm. have been uh, uh, terminated. So these are some of the elements that uh, ICE can ask for. And again, even if they're not, you have to plan for it. And I would say, I mean, it's critically important that you have all these things vetted. I mean, in one of the standard operating procedure manuals that we got from a vendor, and, and you know, we had the screenshots of you know, all the intake forms. And when you got to the attestation period it, piece, it didn't say, I test under penalty of perjury that I am. It said, pick the status that suits you best. Um, and so imagine if you give that to Rachel, what she's going to say. Yeah, when she know? stops laughing. Yes. And so, but, and this is something that also, you know, while ICE has the three-day deadline for turning over your I-9s, you might get a little bit more time to turn over some of these additional documents with the exception of the audit trails. I think in the uh, electronic I-9 context, the audit trails are part and parcel of that electronic I-9, so you do have to provide them within that three-day period. Uh, but you know, you might have a little bit more time, but you're not going to have an indeterminate amount of time to, at that point, bring counsel to come in. And the question then is, how would you remediate something like that, for example? Uh, it becomes really tricky. To say the least. Um, l let's wrap this up by uh, looking at the integration of E-Verify with electronic I-9s. Sure. So again, I, we've already covered this a little bit, and I think you all know that the main point in integrating an I-9 system with E-Verify is if you're not integrated at all, you're essentially completing an I-9 and then you're taking a, the vast majority of that information and you're retyping it into the E-Verify website. So already you're talking about double entry work and you're talking about the possibility of making mistakes. And we all know that a tentative non-confirmation, it will tend to happen when you have either transcription errors um, or there could be, of course, information in the database itself uh, in terms of name changes and so forth. But obviously, you want to eliminate that particular point. But in addition to that, there are these hidden elements which we'd like to point out. Um, again, there is actually, a, Ron made reference to it, there is a MOU specifically for E-Verify developers that specifies exactly how we need to integrate the system. So in other words, the steps that we need to take. And one of the fundamental steps is we need to look at the website and we need to follow the same rules. So Wendy had mentioned a system whereby um, another vendor has an electronic signature where they're signing section one and they can also attest to a TNC if they were to receive one. So I mean, you know, th that is kind of mind boggling, the fact that you could actually make two attestations and also attest to something you haven't seen yet. 
So, you know, but again, that's just something that highlights following the basic procedure in terms of, you know, how does the E-Verify system work? How should it work? What is the whole point behind it? Well, the point behind the TNC notice is the employee understands what's going on and they have an opportunity to contest or not to contest. Um, so that's certainly number one. TNC handling or even FNC handling is, again, another crucial element um, because there are time frames involved, because there's a lot of misunderstanding about the whole process. We heard from OSC this morning that one of the problems that they see is, uh, you know, you have somebody who all of a sudden is just terminated immediately upon receiving a TNC. Well, how does the electronic I-9 system work? Does it emulate what the E-Verify system work? Does it build in those uh, safeguards so the employer understands what the process should be? And then lastly, the vendor acting as your agent. Uh, this again just goes back to if you're using an electronic I-9 system and it has integrated E-Verify, we are actually required to serve as your agent. So you say, okay, well, what does that mean? That means the vendor has a whole bunch of different client companies and they agree to perform training. Uh, they, they agree to give you software updates. They, they agree to do quite a few things. For example, even if their system uh, is unable to interact with E-Verify for a technical reason, the vendor has to go into the website themselves and actually complete that I-9. That's not something that's known by a lot of people, but it's something that's crucially important if you're entrusting your E-Verify roles uh, to another company. And, and a non-trivial issue, yeah. mm -hmm. by all means. So uh, I think it's fair to say that the, the takeaway from, from this panel should be that electronic I-9s are, are the future. We're, we're all going to be doing electronic I-9s in the very near term. The, the key is finding a good, responsible I-9 vendor that can provide you with an expert system that does exactly what you want it to do and complies fully with USCIS and ICE requirements. And if, if you can get all of that and such systems are available, then your lives are going to be a lot easier. Yes, so yes, proceed with caution. But I mean, I, I agree with you. I think it is the wave of the future, especially for larger employers, because the paper system is not going to allow you to have the level of compliance that you need. And if you know, you've heard the presentation starting with Dan this morning. I mean, you do need increased compliance in this day and age. And I don't think that a paper system, if you're a large employer, is going to allow you to do that. But uh, you know, you have to be, be able to careful. keep up. And even with you know, because I hear it from from clients. Okay, so I get on this electronic system and that's it. You know, I don't have to think about it anymore. And my answer is absolutely not. You have to keep up. Uh, one of the things that we look at is I review, when, when I have a client that is on an, any electronic system, we review the updates. What are the new features that they're coming up with? Are the new features optional or are they really mandating it on, on you? And are those features compliant or not? Or, you know, the other thing that we're seeing is we're seeing vendors that are now uh, realizing that they've made a lot of mistakes in the past and are going back and fixing those mistakes, and in how they fix those mistakes, uh, there's a lot of questions that have surfaced that we've gone like, okay, well, you can't really do it, but explain it to me again. And, and then you, you start realizing that maybe there was, that was not a real fix, um, you know, and that you need to do something else. And the answer there is make sure that you, you go into this process hand in hand with experienced counsel to vet the RFP process thoroughly. Mm -hmm. you know, and I, I think certainly our goal, well, actually certainly my goal, is not to scare anyone um, away from uh, electronic I-9 systems, but it's simply to make you aware of all of the different nuances involved. I think we've heard a lot today about um, employer steps that you can take to bring yourself into a culture of compliance, whether or not that's creating policies or whether or not it's documenting any time you've made corrections. I think an electronic I-9 system can be part of that because, um, you know, again, if you're doing an RFP, or which we've described in detail, you're going to all this, there's a lot of effort going into this. There's a lot of time and money. And obviously, at the, at the end of the day, you expect this to greatly enhance and increase your compliance, make it easier, perhaps <coughs> gain efficiencies that you didn't see elsewhere, um, even gain uh, efficiencies in terms of doing reporting. I can't tell you the number of times clients get so excited simply about being able to generate reports and to look and see how their field is doing, even if they're doing perfectly fine um, throughout. Agreed. Questions? About five minutes for questions, because we started five minutes late, so maybe just a few questions. That's... Questions? Sir? Question about the website. You didn't mention you worked with an audit firm. Mm -hmm. 
You know, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think that, uh, or let me backtrack. I think what I would like to see is not the system making the decision to purge that I-9 on its own, but I would want somebody within the client having to make the decision of whether we're going to purge these I-9s or not. Uh, because in this case, my client was completely unaware that this was happening, and on the eve of audit, we discovered that we have 150 employees in an industry that was somewhat suspect that didn't have I-9s completed at all, and the HR person that you know, simply forgot to complete it, was the only person who spoke Spanish in that entire front. So you can imagine, you know, all the ramifications that came out, out of that. So I would at least like to see a system that would, before purging, give the authority not just to the general user, but to somebody that has management authority within the system, an administrator type, uh, that would make that decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and, and even think of it in the paper world. If I'm completing an I-9, and this is something that I tell my clients, if you're completing the I-9 in the paper world, and the employee completes Section 1, but by the time they give you the documents, you look at the documents, if the documents do not reasonably appear to be genuine or to belong to the person, I tell my client, keep that I-9 and keep copies of those documents. Don't complete it, obviously. I mean, don't complete yeah. Section 2. But keep it as evidence that you, in good faith, looked at these documents. They didn't quite look right. Why wouldn't you do the same in the electronic world? Let's say you have that situation where Section 1 wasn't fully completed. You still need a record. I mean, and, and if you go back to the audit trail uh, requirement, that they have a record of in real time. Uh, of when you're completing it, I think you still need it there. And yeah. to keep it the same length that you would have kept it for, you know, for somebody that you would have terminated that same day. Even though it's not a fully complete I-9. Even if it's not a fully complete I-9. I think it just builds integrity and transparency, which is what ultimately they want to see. I mean, they want a transparent system that tells the real story. If you completed an I-9 halfway and didn't finish it, well, you know, there it is, and it will be purged three years from now. And I, would just, I would piggyback, because we actually we have a, a client that had that exact same scenario. Again, working within the three-day rule, um, they had people who actually started work, yet they had not, they, had, they were taking that full three days to present documents, then they were not able to present documents, then they showed up later. They wanted to have that incomplete I-9 because the employee was working for those, you know, one yeah. or two days. So I think, I think that's a very important feature to have. Last question, gentlemen in the back. Okay. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Next question. Which is the only question we have, I guess. Okay. Does, does the electronic I 9s automatically purge terminated employees at the point it's supposed to occur? Well, see that, and that, that, ha yes, if, 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 uh, have John maybe. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll repeat it. Do electronic I-9s automatically purge the I-9 record when it's reached that retention date? So in other words, the employee has been terminated, the three-year, one-year rule has been met. Does an electronic I-9 automatically purge? And because, of course, there are no standards, uh, it really depends. So it depends on your system. Now, I would suggest that it should not automatically purge um, for the very simple reason that what happens if all of a sudden, the day before that, ICE has showed up and has issued you that notice of inspection, and meanwhile your system kicks in and says, oops, we're going to delete that I-9. I mean, I don't think that's a situation that uh, any employer wants to find themselves in where the system is doing something in an automated fashion and not giving you that uh, way. You notification And then give somebody authority, right. you know, to go in and approve that purge. And the deci I don't think the decision should be the vendor, so I think it should be the company. There, it's your data, yeah. your I-9. Absolutely. And your liability. Okay, that's it. Thanks.